First, there was the High Return Real Estate Show. Now, upgraded to the Higher Return Real Estate Show. Deeper insights, greater value. It's time to build your empire. You guys are in luck today. I've got young, on the rise superstars on Instagram. I want to tell you guys a little bit about them. They've paid off almost a hundred thousand in debt in less than three years. In fact, just today they made a pretty big payment, so they're super close, which is awesome. Excited for you guys. They own two duplexes, so guys, they have four units that are producing cash flow on a monthly basis. Which uh, you guys all know, I'm a huge fan of rental property. Sometimes though, I, I'm not quite sure if I, I love it or hate it, but you know, most of the time it's pretty awesome. They're going to teach us how to scale an audience today, which is going to be awesome. And Ali and Josh, welcome to the show. You guys, pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for that amazing introduction, Jack. I'm, I'm very flattered and I'm like, wow, we have done some cool yeah. stuff, but uh, we're really excited to connect with you today. Yes. You you get caught up in the, the hustle and bustle of everything and you get so focused on where you are that it's easy to lose track of some of the stuff that we've done so far. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we all need to like remind ourselves and stop and, you know, just kind of take a little bit of inventory of how much we've actually done. I know for achievers and this podcast, the way that like I speak is going to attract achievers. It's going to repel everybody else. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I already know who's listening. And we have this tendency as achievers to constantly be looking to the next thing and never really stopping and kind of, I hate to say smell the roses, but because whoever does that, but just, just being present and mindful and saying, man, you know, like you've done really good, dude. Like just maybe calm down a little bit and enjoy, you know, what you've achieve but then uh you know that's very hard for us to do because we just keep wanting to drive for more but at any rate it is important to do that so yeah you guys have uh, quite the resume and you're just getting started so tell us a little bit about you know like your background i know you guys you know you both have full-time jobs you're very young well actually you just posted on your page ali that job is gone which is exciting <laughs> so tell us of what's going on how did you guys get started in the finance and where did it all begin yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it all began at State College in New York. This guy was in my major, and we were both majoring in child and family studies, and we met. Josh was one of three men in our major, so he really stood out because it was predominantly women. Kind of unlikely candidates for investing, real estate investing, all of that. I mean, we were human service professionals making very low to average salaries. And I remember in college, our professors told us, you are probably not going to like make a lot of money in life. And you're probably not going to have a, a great financial position. That's just the field you signed up for. Yeah. Wow. You, the, the career is that you're kind of go into for impact and help people, but don't bother trying to you know, make a comfortable living. And so that was kind of our, our baseline. So we met in college. We didn't start dating right away. We were just friends for several years. Uh, and then eventually you were in the friend zone. Oh, he yeah. was like well, literally so friends. I was dating someone and she was single. <laughs> I called him boy with the girlfriend because he had a girlfriend. It's a long story. So and eventually I didn't have a girlfriend, but he she was had boy a boy without the girlfriend. And she anyway. had a boyfriend. And um, and then yeah, eventually uh back in 2013, stars aligned. We were both single, so we we're like, let's take a chance on it. And uh that's how we got started dating, and then really for about five years between us both working full-time, eventually Allie went back for her master's. I mean, we just kind of, we're just living life, just figured, hey, this is what people do. Things will work out. And we weren't thinking about our finances. We, were, <laughs> we were really broke most of our 20s yeah. and yeah. really in debt and living a very leveraged lifestyle of spending more than we were making. And sure. we were doing all those things that like society tells you to do and we felt like was important to do. And we weren't really thinking much else no and it wasn't until probably the middle of 2017 so Allie was getting ready to graduate with her master's and just for the heck of it I was like you know we've never really tallied up I know we have student loans but we've never looked at them maybe we should kind of figure that number out and it was right about that time um, just doing the math I was like we got over a hundred thousand dollars in student loans we went to state college how the hell did that happen so you right. weren't aware of that you had accumulated over a hundred gay when you checked I mean, I think we knew in 
intellectually somewhere. But you in wanted, you're in denial but mode. Yeah. It was like kind of that head in the sand. Like we know we have this debt, but yeah. whatever, everyone has debt, you well, know? And one thing I'll say too is so both being human service professionals, we are eligible for the public student loan forgiveness program. And it sounds great on paper and it might work for some, but what it really conditions you is to not think about your total gross amount of debt. Because don't worry, it will it get just, forgiven. Yeah, they just, it kind of conditions you to focus on that income driven payment. So I think our payment at that time they was like, low. it's like 200 bucks. I was like, that's our debt, right? Um, I wasn't really thinking like a hundred and something thousand dollars. So I was like, oh, that's totally going to get forgiven. We just have to work in these income, low income jobs for, you know, 10 or 12 years or whatever it is. But then, and I know this is a lengthy introduction, yeah. but, <laughs> and then we kind of realized, you know, it, the year of our wedding, Josh had gotten laid off from a long-term employer. We now were working on one income, which again, a less than $50,000 income. I think I started my career with the master's making $45,000 and 60k plus in debt right so very quickly we said we need to shift some stuff around because this is not working and this is not the life we want to live wow so you guys said okay we're going to attack this debt once you became aware of mm -hmm. you know like okay this is a pretty big number we want to get this energy released out of our lives so what did the plan look like i mean you guys still you know, you're, you're still up until this, like what, two weeks ago, Ali, you were still working a job that in social work, right. That doesn't right. pay a lot. Right. So how did you guys do this in three years? I mean, almost a hundred thousand that, I mean, I think there's people that make two or three times what you guys are, are making that would have a trouble doing the same thing. So yeah. What did that look like? Right about the time we started calculating our debt, we also tried to say, well, how can we get rid of it? So I just went to the internet. And the first thing that popped up was Dave Ramsey, Total Money Makeover. So I ordered that book because as I said, this is a guy who talks about paying off debt and that's what yeah. we want to do. So we started living the rice and beans lifestyle, as they put it. And uh, we were cutting out the Starbucks and the Netflix and all that kind of stuff. But it didn't really feel like it was having as big of an impact. And it felt like actually eventually just kind of feeling like we were kind of deprived, like we're saving 10 bucks here, 15 bucks there, so on and so forth. And we were both working a ton of hours. And so yeah. uh, we needed to make a change. So that didn't feel super sustainable for us. So I think really for Josh, it brought him back to the internet to yep. find something <laughs> that did feel like a good fit for us. And that is when we discovered the beautiful world of real estate investing. Yeah. So neither one of us, again, we don't have backgrounds in real estate. They definitely don't have backgrounds in finance. We discovered the term house hacking, where basically you could buy either a single family home, rent out all the rooms, or in our case, you could buy a duplex, live in one unit, rent out the other unit, and you can use a low down payment, which is really good because we didn't have a ton of money. Um, but just back of the envelope math, I was like, we were paying like $1,300 a month in rent. I was like, we could probably live for like $300 a month instead of paying that much, which would be a huge savings for us. Dave Ramsey, super constrictive, restrictive process. I get that. A lot of people have had success with that, but my philosophy aligns with what you guys are saying. I mean, you can only cut back so much to the point of which if you're really like unhappy and depressed, like how long are you going to go before you think you just go out and, you know, splurge and say, mm -hmm. F it, I'm done with this thing. You know, then it becomes counterproductive. So it does have to be something sustainable. So so essentially it's like you're lining up and I wasn't even thinking about this before you came on, but you're lining up the philosophy that I've always shared is it's so much easier to produce more income than it is to cut back that much. Now, some people, I was just on a call, a coaching call with a gal who she spends between her and a husband, $2,300 a month on car payments wow. for, two, for two cars, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they make 10 to up to 20,000 a month on a really good month and they're, and they're, they have no money. So that's a situation, right? Where we need to be cutting back and sell the cars or liquidate the cars or turn the cars back in and do that. But you, you guys had already, sounds like you had done a lot of the cutbacks and now is time. Okay. We got to make more money. We got to figure out how to get a new additional streams. Okay. So you bought the one duplex that you lived in one side, rented out the other. Yeah. And then how did you go about getting the other one? 
So we cut back as much as we reasonably could. But as renters, that is hard because you have money every month going to, you know, your landlord. So for us, we said, let's become the landlords. So right away, we reduced our cost of living radically. We got rid of our car loans and we had used cars purchased in cash. We got rid of our car payments, that zero. Um, our rent went from $1,300 a month to 600 So we cut that in half. And then with raising rent and doing some renovations, we eventually Eventually got down to like 300 and then hold on so that's your that's your total like between the rent you're getting on the other side of the duplex your total payment for the duplex minus out the rent and then your net payment was 300 dollars yeah, we were just paying yeah. 300 bucks to ourselves. So we were able That's to incredible. radically reduce our cost of living because when you think of what people spend most of their money on, it's housing, transportation, and food. Yep. So right there, we slashed housing and transportation. Um, and with having that extra breathing room, it allowed us to take more career risks. Josh went into more entrepreneurial endeavors mm-hmm. that were able to have a higher ROI with his uh, you know, income. I was able to apply to another job that substantially raised my pay. So bit by bit, we were kind of stacked the pieces in our favor to was, better our situation. I was still driving for Uber. <laughs> Ali started doing life coaching. I think at one point we had like seven jobs. Between and, the two of us. Before <laughs> social media, anything like that. Great. Because our goal was to grow the gap between our income and expenses. And we between house hacking and, and having no cars, that lowered it probably just about as far as it would reasonably go. If we went any lower, I think we probably would have got burned out. Um, yep. So that at that point, it was a how can we increase our income? And so between career changes and consulting and all these different things, we started generating more revenue. We were scrappy, though. Like we <laughs> had a vision. We knew what we wanted. We knew that we did not want to be in debt forever. We didn't yep. want to be broke forever. We wanted more time with each other. We made some uncomfortable <laughs> decisions and some decisions that people all around us were like, are you guys crazy. Um, And we did it. And now three years later, we're just really starting to see some big payoffs from the choices that we made three years ago. Hey, thanks for supporting our show. If you want to find great rental properties that are not available to the general public, subscribe to our Insiders Club email list. Just head on over to highreturnrealestate.com and wait for the pop-up. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing payoffs for things that I've done, you know, five years ago um, Mm -hmm. that it, you know, it typically takes three to five years before an investment like of energy or an investment, like to start a business, right. Or an investment of money. I mean, they usually take three to five years to really say, wow, payday, like this is worth it or more. Some investments uh, I've found take even longer than that. So it's important to think long-term, long-range. And so you guys are, you're thanking your past selves, right? You're you're saying thank you so much for what you did for us because now we're enjoying a better life. Okay, so then with the other duplex, what is then the income from that? That was kind of a cool story. Again, like our goal in the beginning, Jack, wasn't like we want to be real estate investors. We just don't want to spend money on rent. And so that we, we kind of checked that box. And now, so we bought that at the end of 2018. And then 2019, we just started throwing everything we could at those student loans to start making progress. But then along the way, we started networking and we we're like, you know, this real estate stuff is kind of powerful. That was really, I think, our first taste of getting money that wasn't directly related to us working a job or whatnot. It was just that first rent check was life changing. It was very cool. Yeah. And so, um, so then we we spend a lot of time in our city and networking and talking to other investors. And we live in a nice little neighborhood. And we just so happened to walk past another duplex five houses down from our first duplex. And we always thought like, man, that'd be so cool to own that property. Like whoever owns it did a really good job with it. Well, I'm a networker. It's a small neighborhood. So I just started talking to people and they pointed me to the owner who actually happened to live in the neighborhood. So we started having that conversation and he's like, you know, I'm willing to work with you guys. I don't want to, I don't want to list it and I need to sell it quickly. And luckily we'd been saving up enough where we could make it happen. So last year, actually in September, we bought that duplex actually using a three and a half percent FHA. We moved into the downstairs unit. We rented our old apartment, which now that unit by itself covers the entire mortgage. And so that property cash flows enough So that the portion of the rent that we would have had to pay down here, which was like 200 bucks, that property pays that. So now our housing is zero. Incredible. Because most people, 
you know, they're spending in their 20s, 2000 a month on rent or house payments, or, I mean, I talk to people all the time that are at those kind of numbers. So for you to have that at zero and then have your cars at zero, yep. and then, so you're, you're, you got food, you know, you got your incidentals, entertainment, all that, but you're living to the point of where you're probably have a lot of investable dollars to yes. work with, which it doesn't matter how much you make. It's if you're trying to build wealth anyways, what matters is how many investable dollars do you have per month? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say when we first started our journey, we were at like a negative percent savings rate. Like we, <laughs> we were really, it was yeah. really rough. And then I think after that first house hack, we bumped it up. Second house hack, we were probably hovering into 60% savings rate. And at this point, I mean, what would you say? Um, I mean, we save 100% of the income that we get from our jobs. And by save, I mean, that's how big student loan payments happen. That's how, frankly, that's how big renovation budgets happen. This property we bought was a, a lot more of a fixer upper than we uh, budgeted for. But luckily, mm. because there's such a wide gap uh, between our income and expenses, we were able to cash flow the renovation. So, um, but yeah, I mean, all of the money from our job, really, because it's not jobs as much plural anymore, but um, it's just money that all of that's just been going into paying off debt, uh, saving up for our next rental property. And then ev everything else is going into the brokerages and traditional retirement accounts. Did you use an FHA loan? And can you kind of talk a little bit more to the listeners about how you're able to get it for three and a half percent down? Absolutely. So for our first property, we used a 5% conventional loan. And for the second one, we used a 3.5% FHA loan. So the reason why we really like house hacking, which as Josh explained, you buy a property and you move into the property is that you qualify for those very low down payment owner occupant loans. So we're buying multifamily homes that will eventually be investments. When we move out of them, they're our primary residents, but they are our primary residents. So we can mm. qualify for those low down payments. If so you were just buying it as an investment rental property and not living in it, yeah. then you don't qualify for those types of loans, right? And so right. You, therefore you're paying 20, 20, you typically 25% yeah. down. Mm -hmm. is and that was the thing. I think that's a huge hindrance to a lot of new investors because they don't have that kind of money. I right. mean, for our first house hack, we skipped our honeymoon. We yep. scraped together every damn dollar that we had and we bought a duplex, right? Yeah. That is not, um, that is not exciting we or sexy a, we, for most people. We took like a three day <laughs> trip to uh, the ocean and then we came back and we were like, all right, we have three months to buy a duplex. Let's buy a duplex. So we, we yeah. use that money to get that investment but but i think it opens investing to people that otherwise would be intimidated because hey you can move into your investment you need a place to live buy a duplex and have someone pay for more than half of your mortgage and it really gives you a nice experience with real estate investing to see if it's something you want to pursue even more so for your next property i mean you can only like live in so many properties right like are you going to do another house hack the third time or are you going to do a <laughs> traditional rental property yeah. like what's the plan look like well i think if we kind of change our mind every now and then because once you get a zero dollar housing payment there's something pretty nice about that that you want to keep that up right but we had the goal that we wanted to have enough rentals where the cash flow will pay for a single family home for us so no we don't plan to house hack forever and we are a little over having to scrape every dollar that we put together. Um, so very much for the next deal, we will be partnering with private money to purchase properties in cash outright. And we will eventually find ourselves into a modest starter home. Okay. So I would argue that we're not arguing, but I would make the point that the biggest expense you're ever going to have in your life is your taxes. Yeah. Now you guys haven't felt the effect of that yet, but you guys are on your way to being high earners. So then you're going to figure it out quick. Okay. <laughs> so trust me, um, it, 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 it is uh, much bigger than, than housing and auto and food combined by far. So what What's great about what you're doing with the house hack and tell us about the tax advantage of when you go to sell. How does that, what does that look like? How does it work? You have to live in it for so long. Can you explain that? But it's really, really incredible what you yeah, can Yeah, so absolutely. So again, we as quote unquote house hackers, we get the same mortgage benefits as if someone were to go out and buy like a traditional single family home, but kind of like what you're alluding to, 
we also get the same tax benefits. So um, for real estate investors. For real estate. So for instance, there's what's referred to, and this probably has like a technical term for it, but like the two out of five year rule. Our mm -hmm. very first duplex, we were there for, I think almost two years. If we were to sell that, we wouldn't pay any tax on any capital gains. And the property is appreciated a lot because we did reside in that property where a lot of investors, if they never reside in the property, they get a lot of capital gains and then they, and they don't want to like do like a 1031 exchange. One, they're probably going to have to pay capital gains. And two, they may run into like a depreciation recapture. And all of a sudden you could have like this big chunk of equity and it can really quickly get gobbled up by all those expenses. But that's some of the benefits that come with owner occupying properties. And we always say, find yourself a really good investor friendly CPA, right? And we don't have to be the tax experts because nope. our CPA is. So if there's a write off or, you know, there's expenses for the property, he's going to help us find it. And I think for us is buy and hold investors. We have no short term plans to sell our properties. Nope. I think our goal is to have a modest, like eight to 10 unit portfolio um, that we maintain for a while, right? Um, as long as it makes sense for our life. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree about working with your account for sure. What I've found is that talking to a lot of, you know, people at various stages of their investing is, careers is that the accountants typically don't inform them proactively about things like the two out of five year rule. Like that was something that I didn't even know up until maybe a few months ago, surprisingly. I'm like, why didn't I ever know that? But I, you know, I wasn't ever in a position to where I had that advantage of a house actually that I lived in that went up in value to where I could take the capital gains. But that's huge. I mean, if you think about like, I just had a property where I bought it, I don't know, five years ago in Arizona. And it, I mean, I just sold it for 100, 160 K profit. If I would have lived in that, what is that? 20% capital gains on 160 K. That's huge. 32, yeah. $32,000 that uh, I would have saved on that sale right. if I had just lived in it for a couple of years. So that is a, a huge thing that you guys, you know, that you're listening, you want to start really considering that. Um, and that's why this house hacking system that they're doing is so incredible because not only are they living for free, but all the value inc increase as the government prints more and more money, which they're not stopping on, real estate is going to continue to rise in value. And now uh, you don't have to pay taxes on that game. So we actually have friends. What you're describing is literally, that's their business model. So they do live in flips in higher cost of living areas. So places like Arizona, Denver, Colorado, places where a lot of people think, oh, it's impossible to buy, but they're, they're buying some pretty tough properties. They're forcing the appreciation through sweat equity mm -hmm. with the knowledge that if they're there for you know two years or whatever, when they realize that they're going to have a huge chunk of equity, which they can then put into another piece of property. And then they just it kind of like leverage Snowball, up that yeah. way to the point where the equity becomes two to four to seven hundred thousand dollar chunks of equity, especially in those higher price markets. That's incredible. I love that strategy. That's another thing that I talk about all the time is that, you know, I'm not a patient type of personality. Like I love action and deals and like models uh, where I can force equity, you know, where I can take a business and I can with my energy and passion and drive, I can force the value of that business up through the cash flow coming in. So to be able to do the same thing in real estate, take a property, fix it up, forcing the value up, not waiting for the market to go up. You force the value up with your actions like you did with your other duplex. Mm -hmm. And now on top of that, you don't pay taxes on that forced equity plus the market appreciation well, equity and gain. That's, <laughs> I love it. That's incredible. Hey, thanks for being a listener. To find great rental properties, and become a more savvy investor, head on over to highreturnrealestate.com. What's cool too, right? So sometimes the stock market is referred to like a perfect, you know, a perfect market. There's so many things and variables that kind of go into it. Whereas real estate, I mean, you can use, you know, networking and stuff like that. So like our second property it, we bought it for 150, knowing that we felt it was worth a lot more than that. So it appraised for 168. So day one, yeah, you know, that's eighteen thousand dollars in equity. Mm -hmm. But we knew through all the renovations that we did that we'd force the appreciation even more. If we sold it tomorrow, we'd probably sell it for about 190. So that's a forty thousand dollar capital gain in 14 months. 
that is on your net worth statement too, right? Like that's what a lot of people don't think about is they don't look at oftentimes the equity in, in real estate is that's a serious increase of net worth in a very short period of time. Right. How much time would it take you to create $40,000 when you're working jobs and you're, then you're getting taxed <laughs> and then whatever's left over after that, then that you have to, to invest that versus what you did, you know, just made it, uh, made it happen a lot quicker. Talk about the segue of you paid off a lot of debt. You started, you know, getting some real estate and, and house hacking. How did that lead you to creating your own financial platform and being influencers growing this, you know, large Instagram account, having a book that you've sold a ton of copies of. Tell us more. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the Phi Couple was born in the middle of the night, literally. I, um, you know, we're getting some traction. We're paying down some loans. We got into our second duplex. I woke up in the middle of the night at three in the morning <laughs> and I was just like, I think we should make an Instagram to document our journey. And I just had all these ideas swirling around in my head. And I woke Josh up at three in the morning. And I'm like, I have the best idea. Like we should do this. And I remember he was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I'm going back to bed. That's a dumb idea. And I think the next morning he was like, that's the stupidest yeah. idea. We're not going to do that. Right. He thought it was such a dumb idea because here's the thing. <laughs> we're not so like, if you know us outside of the five couple, we're not social media people. Nope. We were never like super engaged on social media are super into it. So it seems a little out of character maybe, but the reason why I really wanted to create this and do this is because we've listened to all the podcasts, we've read all the books, all of this stuff. So often the stories that we heard about people that built wealth and found success they were high income earners. They either had money previously or they were born in families where they learned about money and financial habits and they didn't have any student loan debt. And they had a lot of um, factors that were in their favor, right? So I looked at us and I'm like, we literally blundered through our 20s with $100,000 in student loan debt. We made a million and one financial mistakes. We had no financial backbone. We were very average income earners. And guess what? Like we're real estate investors. We are crushing our debt and we're probably going to retire from our nine to fives in our thirties. So I felt like we always heard that one story. And I said, I want to share a different narrative of folks that made tons of mistakes and they're still figuring out the way to do it, you know? So that was really our thing. Like we're pretty average people, but we have big dreams and, you know, just to share that message too. The relatability factor of what you guys, you know, portray, I mean, it's, you really make a good point there. Each of us has our own unique voice, our own unique story, and we're going to relate to a subset of people and we're going to potentially not relate or repel other people. And you guys, you have a very consistent message. You know, your lane, you know who your audience is, right? So I got to think that that's a big factor into, you know, your success and, and, and all of that. Tell us a little bit more. How did you build? So you started a year ago. How did you build that account from wake up in 3 a.m., have this inspiration, get shut down by negative Nelly over there? Uh, <laughs> or what? I don't know what the, the negative Nelly. version what? of the mail is. I don't have that. Call it Nelly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so you get this, you get this little Instagram account going, right? You have to start at zero, which it's pretty tough as I've found oh, out. Yeah. Yep. And now the 75,000, like what, tell us. I think, I think one of the first things that we had to do, so I'm like, I'm a big Warren Buffett fan. And a big thing he talks about is your circle of competence. And, and you kind of alluded to it before is, you know, we had that conversation if we're going to create this and it wasn't perfect at first and it's still a work in progress, but it was kind of like, what are we going to talk about? What's our circle of competence? And so, you know, we had the dry erase boards and everything like that. We're going to talk about this, this, and this real estate index funds and paying off debt. We went for the, the broadest kind of most average entry level kind of things, because frankly, a lot of times those necessarily aren't like the most clicky things or what people are really attracted to, but those are the fundamentals. And then we came up with, and we played around with probably a dozen or so brand names and stuff like that. And so uh, the FI couple, the FI is financial independence. And so we said, we're not, we're not financially independent yet. We're about 50% of the way there, which is actually a big reason too, why we want to start documenting it. Because sometimes you don't hear from people until like, 
they're at the mountaintop mm -hmm. and then they're trying to think reflectively this is how my journey was and so we're not there yet, but we're just a few steps ahead of folks. And so I think that's kind of why we've been approachable and that's kind of driven the content that we produce. So we wanted to stay within our circle of competence. We've also wanted to build that trust and authenticity. You know, we are real people. This is who we are. This is what we believe in. Other than those two things with crafting it, like you want to know the real thing of how we grew a brand, like literally painstaking hours and days yep. of time, right? To grow a social media brand, it is not passive nope. and I think when we started I was more like pie in the sky like this will be fun this will be a cute little hobby we do together and then like I think the first week we were like oh my gosh this is all consuming like yep. this is work um and that so was, it was not easy it was all consuming then and looking back that was probably incredibly passive compared to where it is today well now it's a business right so yeah, yeah. so what's the work you know I think a lot of people they don't have success on these platforms. I think I'm guilty of it in the past too. You know, what does that work really look like? I don't know if people are really that clear of how much effort and energy really goes into getting the type of growth that you've seen, but where does the work kind of go into? Are you following unfollowing people? <laughs> are you putting out 10 posts per day on your news feed? Are you doing 20 stories per day? Are you doing two reels per day? Is you're just cranking out content like crazy or is it more the engagement? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think there's a few, when you first start, you don't know. We didn't know. There's no. a few key levers that you can pull. And I think that's what really drives growth. So one, you want to have clarity on your message and you want to make sure every piece of content you're sending is within your circle of competence and yeah. what your message is, because you want to know who is my ideal customer, follower, person that joins my page? I want to speak to them every time I share information. So that was a big thing for us, clarifying our message. Now that we have a clarified message, we have to share it with the world. So we need to consistently deliver quality content that is sharing that message because you know, with all of this social media, you have different algorithms. And if you're not engaging, you're not going to show up on people's page. Yep. People won't know you exist. So the more you engage, and I don't think it needs to be 10 a day, but I think it needs to be at least four times a week yep. um, posting that can really help drive traffic. So that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty low comparative to what other people have said to do or that I've heard before. Right. So that's the pretty reasonable amount of posting. I mean, that's not even one a day. You're when right. we first started, we were really posting three to four times a week. Now we're probably more in the five days a week. But again, that's after a year of like developing those systems. We probably post five days a week, but every day we're sharing something in our stories. And I think sometimes posting can kind of be confusing because there's like your main feed, which people see that's that's once a day, unless we have like a promotional opportunity in the evening, we might share that. Uh, but then within our stories, we're also sharing both our own content as well as other content. I think in the beginning, so anything visual that you see, like Allie has found a talent that she didn't know she had. All the visuals, she's very, very good at that. My stuff always just looks like stick figures. But I'm kind of like the aggregator of knowledge. I, I'm a voracious reader of books and podcasts and everything like that. So I then take that information to her. And then she puts it into a way that she thinks it will be received well uh, by our followers. So I think in addition to sharing quality content, Instagram is a community and you want to engage with that community. So building partnerships and relationships with other pages and commenting on posts so that it drives traffic to your page. There's lots of those little nuances and strategies, but it's a, it's a lot of levers. <laughs> I think in the beginning, that was probably our largest generator of traffic is I would go on very large pages of, of other brands who we resonate with. And basically, if you picture like playing baseball, you know, looking at pitches coming at you, I would see a post and quickly I would say, I resonate with that. I don't resonate with that. If I do resonate with it, I would try to leave a value add comment, not just like, you know, fire and thumbs up or something like that. But I'd actually try to leave something insightful. That a lot of times what happens is, you know, and this is like all like little technical things, but those comments get pinned. So now if you have a very large page that's getting hundreds of thousands of views, when they see that post, even if they just scroll down just a little bit, they see the five couple because whoever that creator was saw value in my comment and we would see a lot of traffic. Oh, wow, that's a great comment. Let me go find out more about them. 
And then that helped a lot. I mean, how, many, how long are you on your story for? Not crazy. I mean, on the story, it doesn't have to be you. Maybe if there's a page that you follow and you really like their message, you can reshare their message on your story and be like, love this post from the Phi couple, right? Um, or you could hop on yourself and do some engaging things. It's good for people to see your face. So maybe like an ask us anything where you have your audience ask you questions. So just, you know, you want uh, you want to be top of mind for people. You want people to hop on Instagram and be like, I wonder what the fat couple's doing. And I think when you're consistently putting yourself out there, um, it creates a relationship with your community. And one thing I would say too is, and what I really like about Instagram in comparison to other platforms is on the back end, they give you a robust amount of analytics. And that's actually been really, really helpful for us. At least once a week, sometimes twice a week, we'll go through all of our posts, look at all the analytics. And very quickly, you can see what people are engaging with versus what they're not engaging with, so on and so forth. And that kind of shows us, okay, this is what people really like. Therefore, this is what we're going to offer them more of. So what are you looking for on the analytics in terms of you got likes, comments, shares, saves, right? Those are the four main analytics. And then below that is going to show you how many accounts you've reached, how many new accounts you've reached. What are you guys looking for when you look at the analytics? Are you saying, well, this post totally bombed out and and this one and then why and try to figure out why and then this one resonated and really hit you know how do you determine too whether something's successful or not that's exactly it and i think in the beginning we were throwing anything against the wall to see what sticks right like we tried all different types of content some of it did not do well some of it did and i think the longer you do it you kind of get it to a science of we know what works we know what our audience resonates with and that is what we you know share and we used to think likes was like the best barometer for people getting value from your content. It's not. Typically what we look for the most is actually shares and saves. To us, those are really good metrics of people saw real value in this so much so that they decided, A, they're going to share it with a friend or whomever, or they thought it was so good that, wow, I have to come back to that and see it again. Those are really, really good. And then also with Instagram, you can see how many of your own followers saw your content versus how many people who weren't previously following you, um, which means the algorithm has determined that this is so good, it needs to let all these other people know about that. And that's always a really good sign too, because then you're generating new content and new followers. You guys have created some products or some offer some services that you can help monetize your brand, right? Tell us a little bit about the ebook. What does it teach? How can the uh, listeners get a hold of it? And then what else do you offer in your scope of services? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Josh and I created a 53 page ebook all about house hacking. So what we have done twice with our duplexes, we made a lot of mistakes along the way, but we've sure. learned a lot along the way, right? Sure. So we wanted to kind of share like, hey, this is our experience. This is what's worked for us. This is what we'd recommend and share that with our audience because we get questions all the time about it. It's kind of the guide we wish we had when we got started with house hacking. So we really pack that in with as much information as we can. And it's been incredible because we're sharing knowledge with our audience. And we've also created another income stream for ourselves that can help us reach our financial goals. Yeah, I think that's been really transformative for us. And then along with the ebook that we provide, we get so many questions on a day to day basis. A lot of them are just kind of like elementary, you know, what's an index fund? What's a Roth versus a 401k? And it got to the point where like my hands literally hurt because like you're banging against a phone all day and you're trying to answer. We're does, all going to have purple tunnels, yeah, right? Yeah, all these questions. And we said, so is there a more concise way that we could go about providing webinars and other educational information beyond just, you know, more content? And so we actually partnered with a business partner of ours down in West Virginia, where we have an online community, educational in nature, and we talk about everything real estate, personal finance, debt payoff, side hustles, entrepreneurship, social media, you name it. Um, it's called More Than Money. And we're super, super proud of that. And we started that about three months ago. And now we're starting to get those testimonials of people who uh, are part of the community. And they said, you know, because of this webinar or because you guys shared that thing, um, they're now starting to see success. And that's that's really like a big motivator for us, but that's also been a really nice um, financial uh, economic engine for us as well. I mean, I have to say, you know, like the reason why I originally reached out to you is because I'm the new finance creator, right? I mean, I've had certainly done pretty well in the offline world, but <laughs> I've never 
built a large social media presence. And so I don't know how to do it. If I haven't done it, I don't know how to do it. Right. I mean, I know I can know theory and I know all that, but I saw what you guys were doing. I, I loved your, your content and message and you guys responded too, which out of five people, nobody else did, which is surprising. Cause I, I offered to pay. I didn't, you know, sometimes you get messages where people are like, they want your time for free, of course. Right. Oh, yeah. Or right. you get those right. daily. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's the thing that's yeah. the thing gotta set good boundaries We've there got, we're, we're getting better with that i yeah. think too like in our profession especially as social workers like yeah. so much of it again i was programmed in college like you're not going to make money you're probably going to be a broke just social give, worker give, just give. give your entire self and that is okay yeah. and i feel like that was the message i got and somewhere along the line i'm like that doesn't feel good. I know that I have a lot to give and I know what I'm worth and this isn't what I'm getting. So I think, you know, we're still in the human services field, but we found creative ways to increase our income and feel like we're being compensated for what we're worth. And that is just the beginning. So that's really cool. Well, that was the one thing I told you guys when you, I saw your price and I'm like, you guys got to charge more. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I understand you were, you were saying, well, we work with so many beginners and they tell us we charge too much, right? But you're, you're going to, as you keep growing, right, you're going to increase the demand and you're going to get a higher, you know, earning clientele that are going to want to to tap your knowledge and expertise. Keep raising those prices steadily. Okay? Something we talk about a lot is like your money thermometer, right? So a big thing for us is we were kind of in that field and it was the norm to be broke and to be in debt and to not make a lot of money. So that was our schema of money, right? That is what our view of expensive was. But you know, what do they say? You're the average of the five people you spend time with. So more and more, we're trying to elevate our circle and surround ourselves with like-minded, successful people that have been there, done that. Very and they're, successful. they're looking down from the mountaintop and we're like, yeah, those are the people that we want to get inspiration from and build relationships with because that is where we want to be one day. So little by little, we're raising that money thermometer um, and we're doing it one step at a time, and, you know? And for us sometimes, admittedly, Jack, it's still a little bit scary just because <laughs> of our backgrounds. And But we're like, no, like there's, there's real value that we're providing. And if a person feels it's too much, then that's totally fine. I'm sure someone else can, you know, provide to them their needs. But we have enough people now who um, are kind of echoing a similar sentiment of, you know, there's real value here and you guys should probably charge more. And so um, that's also been a really humbling experience this year. Yeah. I totally agree with the money thermometer. I've read Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. He calls it the money mindset. Yep. You know, it's called by different things, but wherever you've set the the so-called financial temperature to in your mind, you're going to figure out a way to either create more money and, and raise your income up and such to get to that point. And if you exceed it, you're going to figure out a way to sabotage yourself and kind of just figure out how to get rid of it so that you lower yourself back to where your money thermometer is. So that's why I'm constantly trying to figure out like, and tell myself, program myself all the time that I am earning more money than like what I'm currently earning. I tell myself always now it's like substantially more than what I'm actually making. So that I keep planting that seed into my subconscious mind and raising the money mindset. Okay. So last question, you guys really like index funds. Uh, you promote it quite a bit. Why do you like them so much? A lot of times I, I speak in analogies. So an index fund is kind of like a basket, right? You could go out to the stock market and say, I'm going to try to buy all of the best companies. And um, I think I can pick the best ones. And it seems really easy, but statistically, especially over a long time horizon, it's really, really hard. So with an index fund, instead of trying to find, you know, like the needle in the haystack companies within the stock market, you essentially can own the entire stock market. And then there's also some index funds that are more so like sector specific, like industrial or cannabis or technology or all these different types of things. And so one of the things that you kind of had mentioned earlier is like this love-hate relationship sometimes with real estate. One of the reasons we like index funds or exchange trade of funds is because while we like the power of real estate, I think there's some times where we've looked at each other and we're like, let's just sell the stuff yeah. because sometimes the headaches <laughs> are there. So we like the passivity of, you know, index fund investing. Exactly. And so that's why we try to funnel as much money as we can into something that's a little bit more hands-on like real estate. Um, but long term, we also like the compounding growth that our index funds and exchange trade funds offer us. 
So essentially, you're buying the entire stock market with an index fund, a little piece of each company in the market. And it's something where you don't have to think about. You don't have to watch or look at your individual stock portfolio. So it's really something that the biggest decision from what I can see is simply how much per month am I going to automate to go into this investment? And beyond that, that's the, the most energy that is required of you. Yeah. And that's what we were looking for with our investments. I mean, every other aspect of our life is pretty darn active, right? Very. We were working full-time jobs. We're running a social media business. We have a real estate portfolio that we want to grow. We want to have kids. So if I was also managing a very active stock portfolio, it probably wouldn't perform too well because I don't have the bandwidth for it. Right. So that's kind of the beautiful um, factor with, you know, index fund investing that we really like. So for us, it's less, you know, do we place a bet on a singular company? And it's like, do we long-term believe in the United States economy? I'm very bullish long-term on the U.S. economy, entrepreneurship, so on and so forth. But for us, because for us, that's real estate. We can analyze and find off-market deals and stuff like that. That's not the stock market. And that's where index funds balance things out. And that's where we say stick within your circle of competence. Yep. We know what we're good at. So if we hear that there's this crazy thing that we should buy. We're probably not going to do it because we're not educated on it. So the best investment is the investment you understand, right? So for us, it's stocks and real estate. And that's what makes sense for us. For now. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, there is that decision fatigue too, that always comes into play. Like you're, you know, you were just mentioned on our last coaching call, how some of the big, the big dogs, uh, Zuckerberg, and uh, I don't know who else did it. I think it was uh, maybe Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Yeah. I thought it was somebody at Microsoft, but okay. Apple, they wear the same thing every day so that they don't have to make that decision. I mean, I'm thinking about myself. I mean, some, you know, sometimes it takes some time to like dig through the closet yeah. and figure out what you're going to wear that day. So they're just taking and reducing the amount of decisions that they have to make. So what you're doing essentially is reducing decision fatigue to free yourselves up in your mind and your bandwidth to focus on what you really know and what you're good at. So look, I applaud you on being able to do that of almost, <laughs> it takes a discipline to just buy an index fund and not buy individual stocks and such. I don't, haven't had that discipline yet in my uh, investing career in the stock market. So I do think there's a lot of, certainly a, a lot of value and wisdom to just, let's not think about it much. We're just buying into the whole US economy month after month. Yeah. We've been really fortunate to have a lot of mentors who are older and more successful and experienced than we are. And nine times out of 10, one of the biggest things that always comes back is whatever you're going to do, just focus, stay focused. Because shiny object syndrome is real and the news headlights or, or headlines will say x y and z but just focus on what you guys are going to do double down on that and then at some point once you feel maybe you've developed some level of mastery or several maybe start stepping back and first educate yourselves on these alternative assets like bitcoin or ethereum etc um but before i think sometimes people they want to skip the fundamentals and just go to like the really fun stuff but a lot of times it's the fundamentals that lead to the greatest success. Yeah. You need to have a good, solid foundation that you're building upon. And I think too many, what I see, too many of the kids in their 20s, yep. they want to skip the fundamentals. They want to go right to the stuff that's the high risk, highly volatile, you know, can go up quick, but can go down super fast as well. And I'm with you. I think having that balance between different asset classes and having your pride and true and your stable ones in your portfolio is hugely important to create longevity. So at the end of the day, if you make money super quick, but then you lose it just as fast, that doesn't really change the needle on your net worth and your long-term lifestyle. So thank you so much for being on you guys. Here we go. Have a great day. Hey, thanks for your support. If this episode was valuable to you, then show us some love. Subscribe and take one minute of your time to leave us a review. This is how we get the word out to help more investors. And best of all, it's good for your karma.